Hey, good afternoon. I am uh, Dr. Mascaram Gabrakzaber, Assistant Clinical Professor and Director of Inclusion and Community Engagement in the School of Human Evolution and Social Change at Arizona State University. I feel incredibly privileged to be able to provide timely and important programming such as today's lecture and want to thank all of you for joining us. Welcome to the first event of the academic year in our colloquium series titled Toward a Liberatory Theory and Praxis. Um, as we kick off our fourth year of the series with our 18th colloquium to date. Um, this monthly series aims to highlight the work of contemporary scholars belonging to identities and traditions marginalized within mainstream Western academia who, through their work, confront neocolonial power structures and challenge long-standing norms of knowledge production. It was born out of a demand from our graduate students for exposure to more critical scholarship that is relevant to their lived experiences and the times in which we are living. Specifically, I want to thank Tisa Lowen, Aliyah Hoff, Drs. Anais Roque, and Nalubeka Ross, who worked with me to conceptualize this series and establish its parameters. I also want to thank all of the staff members who have and are helping behind the scenes to make this event happen. Nicole Pomerantz, Megan Martin, Michael Campos, and Misa Pham. Uh, I also want to acknowledge Shesk leadership for supporting and sponsoring this series, um, specifically uh, the continuing support from our new unit director, Dr. Ryan Williams. Uh, before I introduce our speaker today, I want to cover a few housekeeping items. Please note that this presentation and the Q&A to follow is being recorded. You, the audience, will not be visible in the recording and all of your mics will be turned off. Uh, but as I mentioned, we will be leaving time for questions after the talk and we're asking that you write your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If you would like to vocalize the question yourself rather than have me read it out, please write ask live in parentheses at the end of the question that you submit using that Q&A button, and I will call on you and unmute your mic so that um, you may do so. Now, without any further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Marlon Bailey. Dr. Bailey is a professor of African and African American Studies and Women and Gender Sexuality Studies at Washington University in St. Louis. He is former a former professor of Women and Gender Studies and AAAS in the School of Social Transformation here at ASU. Dr. Bailey is a Black queer theorist and critical performance ethnographer who studies Black LGBTQ cultural formations, sexual health, and HIV AIDS prevention. He has served as the Benedict Distinguished Visiting Professor in Africana Studies at Carl College, the Distinguished Weinberg Fellow in the Department of African American Studies at Northwestern University, and a visiting professor at the Center for AIDS Prevention Studies in the Department of Medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. Dr. Bailey is a member of the committee that co-authored the award-winning report, Understanding the Well-Being of LGBTQ Populations, published by the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, this report won the 2021 Achievement Award from the Gay and Lesbian Medical Association. Marlon is a member of the Black Sexual Economies Collective, which edited the volume Black Se Sexual Economies, Race and, and Sex in the Culture of Capital, published by the University of Illinois Press in 2019. His book, Butch Queens Up in Pumps, Gender Performance and Ballroom Culture in Detroit, was published by the University of Michigan Press in 2013. In 2014, Butch Queens Up and Pumps won the Alan Bray Memorial Book Prize awarded by the GLQ Caucus of the Modern Language Association and was a finalist for the Lambda Literary Book Award in LGBT Studies. Dr. Bailey has published in the Architecture Review, American Quarterly, GLQ, Signs, Feminist Studies, Souls, Gender, Place and Culture, the Journal of Gay and Lesbian Social Services, QED, AIDS Patient Care and STDs, LGBT Health, Health Promotion Practice, Con Law Now, and several edited volumes. Dr. Ba Bailey's current book manuscript, In Progress, Black Gay Sex, is an ethnographic examination of the impact of the HIV AIDS epidemic on Black gay men's sexuality. His manuscript is under contract with the University of Cal California Press. He also co-edits co -edits with Jeffrey McCune, the New Sexual Worlds book series, also with the University of California Press. Dr. Bailey is also a performing artist and presented his solo performance called Exploring Black Gay Sex, Love, and Life at Concordia University and McGill University in Montreal, Canada. Everyone, please join me in welcoming Dr. Marlon Bailey. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I like to 
first of all, thank uh, Dr. Meski Gabriel um, and all of those who, including her, who um, put all this work into establishing this series called Toward a Liberatory Theory and Praxis is right down my alley. And I'd like to thank all the staff, faculty, and students um, from the Human Evolution, uh, the School of Human Evolution and Social Change at Arizona State University. Um, I'm going to share my screen and get started. I'm so excited to be here. And this, okay, there we go. So first, um, I want to share my appreciation for this opportunity to take a step back and take stock of the overall trajectory of my scholarly career over the last 20 years. I have in 2025, it'll be two, 20 years since I started, earned my PhD. And we, we scholars do not always get a, a chance to talk about the relationship between our methodology, epistemology, and sociopolitical outcomes that we seek, especially as it relates to social justice. So this is really a good, really good for me, um, and I hope that you will find it find my thoughts today beneficial to you. I've organized my talk as a kind of collection of notes from the field that center on community-based ethnographic projects that are that are both designed to challenge and received and dominant notions of gender, sexuality, and health to wrestle the examination of Black LGBT knowledge and practice in HIV prevention from public health, a, in my view, settler colonial institution that in its HIV prevention and gender and sexual health promotion efforts dispense violence, dispenses, uh, dispense violence on the very communities it claims to be trying to protect and save. So, um, Working at the nexus and under the at this nexus and under these conditions, centering knowledge and practices of everyday vulnerable and subjugated communities within a public within public health require commitments to social equity and justice. And so I titled my talk. Uh, um, <laughs> what did I? Oh, decolonizing black sexualities notes on a black queer ethnographic research praxis. And I wanted to look at how um, I approach my research and um, how I engage my research and, and what are the possibilities that knowledge production can make toward uh, social justice and equity, particularly around gender and sexuality. So what, um, what is a Black queer ethnographic research praxis? That's one of the central questions that I am addressing. What is a Black queer ethnographic research praxis? Why is an engagement with community and academic knowledge about gender and sexual sexuality crucial in the struggle for social equity and justice? And what does it mean to do gender and sexuality research for uh, social justice? And so these are the uh, central questions that I'll be exploring. And I just want to walk through how we get to, in terms of research, how we get to this one, decolonizing uh, genders and sexuality, Black genders and sexualities, and two, um, how do we get to seeing research, ethnographic research as praxis? So first, I approach my work as a Black queer theorist, but also a Black queer ethnographer. And I, and I was thinking through and decided to kind of put together what I see as sort of definitions of both Black queer and then what might praxis be um, as it connects to Black queer um, as I engage in my research. So Black queer, 
I'm thinking of, of it as a conceptual and theoretical, uh, as conceptual and theoretical frameworks that center Black LGBT ways of knowing, experiences, and lives, which exists at the intersections of race, gender, sexuality, class, HIV status, and other vectors of power. And at some point, I'm going to go back to this whole notion of HIV status as a social category that is a very important dimension to my research on um, and with Black LGBT communities, particularly Black gay men. And so what might it be mean to be a part of a praxis? Um, praxis is a process through which I'm saying it as a process through which the theories that emanate from the study of Black queer life get enacted. And the engagement with and participation in Black queer cultural formations. And as I move through this talk, this will begin to make more sense. And also, I approach my ethnographic research as a co-performative witness, um, a co-performative witnesses, witnessing a theory and method methodological um, contribution made by Dwight D. Conquer Good. Uh, captures the way in which as researchers, we are part of the very knowledge production, cultural practices, and cultural worlds that we are also researching. As a critical ethnographer, according to uh, performance ethnographer D. Soyedi Madison, which I draw from heavily in my work, the critical and critical ethnography begins with an ethical uh, responsibility to address processes of unfairness within a particular lived domain. So if we think about how critical ethnography is joined with Black queer as a concept, as a theoretical basis, and also that draws from uh, the lives and experiences and ways of knowing of Black queer people and put that together with praxis, um, participating in co and witnessing in the very per performances, practices, um, and worldviews that you are examining, but also putting uh, liberatory, revealing and exposing inequities and putting liberatory knowledge production into action that's where we kind of get at um, a uh, Black queer ethnographic research pr uh, praxis. So this is what will um, I will demonstrate in the two research projects, um, one on the ballroom community, some of which I am still engaged in, and my new project, um, Black Gay Sex. Um, so the first, the first thing that um, I think is important is to think about what do we mean by decolonizing and therefore what is colonization and how has colonization impacted Black genders and sexualities? According to uh, Shauna Jackson, the term colonialism refers to uh, the ways that geographies and space and people of an endogenous place and land are subjected to the forced reorganization and occupation by foreigners whose political loyalties remain external to that colonized space. She goes on to explain that colonialism, uh, colonization, sorry, is about social, political, psychological, political, eco economic, cultural, discursive and cognitive domination and subjugation. This will become very important um, when we talk about gender and sexuality. Other scholars have highlighted how for black people, the aim then, then and now has been about the domination of not just space and geography and culture, but also the black body. Settler colonialism in the U.S. influences current hegemonic norms of gender and sexuality, particularly from those, uh, the, particularly particularly the imposition of Christian worldviews on Native and Indigenous peoples and Africans. For Black people in the U.S. who suffered unspeakable 
forms of sexual violence, including rape, force, breeding, genital mutilation, and other um, forms of violences, it because of sexual colonialism and enslavement, these experiences have impacted how Black people relate to ourselves and others in terms of gender and sexuality and how we as a, in society are seen and viewed and how our institutions engage with Black people in terms of our gender and sexuality. So the settler colonial racialized gender and sexual norms have, I would call a chokehold on our communities and shape how we live gender and sexuality. I'm currently working on a project that's um, in collaboration with the University of Rochester and the New York State Health Department and that is engaging with the 1619 project to um, think about, explore and teach and undo health disparities. And the argument is that the what is covered, the, the um, um, content of the 16, 1619 project and the, the historical articles and examples of um, Black people's experiences in the U.S. are connected to um, current inequalities and inequities. And I'm working on the module that looks at the impact of enslavement and the sexual violence that I described excuse me, on current health disparities in the U.S. So that's an example of how important it is as a researcher to analyze and expose inequities, um, in this case, to uh, expose historical harms that continue to underpin and undergird um, Black conditions today. And so, when when we talk about uh, colonization of gender and sexuality, or what uh, we might refer to as discursive colonization, or psychological colonization, um, Essex Hemfield, who was a Black gay HIV prevention sexual health um, act political activist, um, who unfortunately died in the early 90, 1990s of complications of HIV AIDS, um, was a very influential uh, poet and artist. And uh, I use a lot of his poetry in my teaching and also in my current book project. And I just want to read an excerpt from his poem, Occupied Territories. The state wants to control your sexuality, your birth rate, your passion. The message is clear, your penis, your vagina, your testicles, your womb, your anus, your orgasm, these belong to the state. And this excerpt and the rest of that poem captures very well um, the impact of colonialism and settler colonialism still today on how um, Black LGBT people, Black people in general, but uh, in my work, Black LGBT people um, the constraints that they have to work within in terms of living and developing a, re a relationship with their own bodies and living gender and sexuality. And this becomes an obstacle in many ways to the institutions that I am constantly engaged with in terms of my research as a sexual health researcher and an HIV AIDS researcher and an LGBT cultural formation researcher. So how do we begin to decolonize um, gender, Black genders and sexualities? Well, what we, what I find is by working with communities, within communities and centering community knowledge, it's a way to create a counter-hegemonic, uh, counter-hegemonic knowledges. I argue that LGBT community formations like ballroom culture and like the Black gay men um, that I, my Black gay male interlocutors in my current book project, create counter hegemonic knowledges and what performance theorist Jose Esteban Munoz argues is alternative vistas and, vistas and alternative worlds. 
So they create um, in my current book project, for example, Black Gay Men, I argue, create a alternative or a Black gay epistemology of sex that is counter to the dominant um, HIV prevention discourses of how you should engage in sex and what is safe sex and so on and so forth. I'll talk about that later. <clears throat> but when I first uh, talk about the ballroom community and what is the ballroom community? Ballroom community is a Black and Latinx uh, LGBT cultural formation that exists throughout North America and now throughout the globe. Many of you, I'm sure, have heard of the ballroom community through Paris is Burning and some of the more recent uh, films and television shows such as, or series such as Legendary and Pose. Um, so this community in my book was uh, an ethnography of this community based in Detroit, Michigan, but uh, mm -hmm. the book ca ca uh, captures uh, the overall network of ball scenes in communities and houses throughout North America at the time. An example that I want to focus on as a form of decolonizing um, Black genders and sexualities is that within the ballroom world, they create their own gender system, kinship system, which is their, their houses. And balls are uh, performances, competitive performance, performance events uh, where the um, essence of the ballroom community is expressed through performance. I want to start with the gender system. Uh, there's a um, um, photo of the of Paris is Burning, which is a film, a documentary film on the ballroom community that came out in 1990. And this film um, captured ballroom practices in the late 1980s. Ballroom, the ballroom community has existed since uh, the 1960s, early 1960s. And the, the part of the ballroom community's gender system, which counters what we do in dominant society or how we see gender in dominant society is that the ballroom community does not see, does not conflate sex categories or sex assignment with gender, right? So for ballroom members, um, there are three sexes, as female, male, and intersex, or those who are born with intersex characteristics. And this, and and for the ballroom community, they make a draw a distinction between um, sex assignment at birth and gender identity, um, be, and mainly because um, the they view sex assignment as also socially constructed, but also very uh, fluid and not fixed. Um, generally, the gender system consists of six parts or six categories of identity. Um, my current, I, I'm involved in a lot of current projects and research on the ballroom community. And I just want to point out that my ethnography captures ballroom practices in the early 2000s. Um, it's, this is my book was about uh, 10 years of ethnographic research on the ballroom community. Um, and <laughs> ethnography, those of you who do ethnography, you know, ethnography, particularly when it's a culture on a cultural formation, it's a snapshot in time, it's a moment in time. And so already, even though the gender system, this is pretty foundational to the gender system, the gender system has expanded and transformed in many ways. And so some of my, um, my research and my book is not quite um, totally accurate to the current ways in which, in, 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 in many ways, to the current ways in which the gender system functions within the ballroom community. But um, the six part gender system is butch queens, um, cisgender men who identify as gay or bisexual men. They are and can be masculine, hypermasculine, or feminine. Fem queens are transgender women or 
M to F at the at various stages of gender transition. Butch Queen's Up and Drag is gay men who gay men who perform in drag. So, for example, RuPaul would be considered a Butch Queen Up and Drag. Butches are transgender men or are female to male at various stages of gender transition, or masculine lesbians or female appearing as male regardless of sexual orientation. And then they have cisgender women who sexuality run the gamut and cisgender men who are not, do not identify as butch queens. Uh, cisgender, the men category can be um, those men who identify as heterosexual, many of whom date and have sex with trans women um, or non-gay identified men. I had a debate with, uh, with one of my uh, ballroom um, friends who is an icon and a scholar of ballroom, and he's very, very much involved in the scene now, whether this category exists, um, he's from the New York scene, whether this category exists uh, throughout uh, North America. He argues that, that the man category um, does not exist in all ballroom scenes throughout the country. So this is an example of the differences uh, that have emerged uh, within this gender system. And um, here's a contestant at a ball. This is our, these images are in my book. Uh, this is a butch contestant walking in butch face category at the Love is a Message Ball. Um, balls involve a range of performances, gender and sexual, sexual identity performances, but also involve voguing, which I'm going to show you a, a clip, clip of in a moment. Um, and it involves uh, skits and I mean, so there, there's a, a range of performances hap hap that happen at uh, balls and houses, members of houses compete on behalf of their house or as what we call 007, so as, as um, um, agents who are, who are not, who do not have an, a house affiliation. This is a Fem Queen contestant um, walking in a Fem Queen body category at the Love that as a Message Ball in 2005. Um, and in a moment, I'm gonna uh, get back to uh, voguing, which happens at, at balls and voguing competitions. Um, but I do wanna point out that the kinship system in ballroom is made up of houses and it's a way that the members of the ballroom community sort of redefine what family is because many of the ballroom members are either ostracized from or marginalized within, not all, but many, their families of origin or their families of origin just don't, can't fully um, care for them and can't fully uh, appreciate the uh, multiplicity of their identities, particularly uh, their queer uh, gender and sexual identities. And so members of the community created the, uh, their own kin uh, kinship system, which uh, have these families that function literally as families, but they uh, really kind of redefine parenting and redefine um, care as something that you do, not necessarily who you are. This is an image of the House of Charles, which is one of the first houses in Detroit, Michigan that was founded in the uh, mid 1990s. I talk about the House of Charles in my book. And this house was very much involved in HIV prevention before they began to participate at, at balls. Generally, in ballroom culture, there are no houses without balls and no balls without houses. But there are some cases where houses um, actually do other kinds of care work and do not uh, prioritize participating in balls as most houses do. The other thing is that houses are mostly uh, a social configuration, not an actual concretized space. However, there are times, and there have been times um, throughout the history of the ballroom community where the house parents, one of the house parents or the house parents or um, or uh, some member uh, members of the house 
uh, allow for people to stay with them who have been kicked out of their home um, or who are homeless or um, unstably housed. And uh, a quick point about parenting. So in ballroom, parenting as a part of this whole not, um, counter hegemonic uh, knowledge about family as something you do as opposed to who you are, it's also about parenting as something that you do as opposed to who you are. And there are different um, categories of gender and sexual identity that can parent, right, then in the dominant society. So mothers are butch queens. And remember, butch queens are cisgender gay men. <laughs> um, but femme queens are also uh, mothers and as well as women. And butches are also butch queens and butches are trans men and men, right? So there are these different categories um, that, uh, can be mothers and fathers. Now, let me add a point. Part of being critical, part of the critically engaging or the critical ethnographic approach to ballroom is to also demonstrate and, and problematize the way that the community doesn't always sufficiently break from dominant norms such as masculinity and femininity. So there's still ways in which, for example, if you take the butch queen who can be both a mother and a father, but the butch queen mother is usually seen as more feminine because the mother is seen as the nurturer. Although on the other hand, a man can nurture, right? So ballroom demonstrates how men can actually nurture while at the same time, often the butch um, mother uh, tends to be uh, more feminine um, or a less masculine, masculine, uh, less masculinized masculinity, and seen as the nurturer. Whereas the father, the butch queen, that's a father, is often more masculine, right? And the father kind of takes on the sort of masculine. A public sphere role in the house, and the mother, even the even if the mother is a butch queen, takes on the sort of domestic sphere role. So there there are ways in which the structure and the uh, social configurative gender labor that exists within the house um, replicate in some ways dominant uh, gender uh, distribution of labor in terms of parenting, but in other ways break. From it. This is an example of a of a ball, and you know what ballroom members do. If you're the hosting house, you decorate the the hall for the ball. Now, um, some of you, I'm sure, or many of you have heard of voguing. I think you've heard of you probably heard of um, uh, Madonna's uh, Vogue video, which. Uh, Madonna did not come up with voguing. Actually, the ballroom community created this, uh, this performance form and there were ballroom members who were actually in her video. Um, this is a, a, a short clip of a pre-ball battle, or we call a pre-ball voguing battle. And at balls, the commentator will call out before the actual official ball competi performance competitions begin, the commentator will call out people who are prominent in the scene. Uh, to just a, a, a note, it's worth noting that uh, one of the arguments that I make about the ballroom community and this, this alternative world or counter hegemonic world that they create is they create different forms of recognition. So uh, there are ways in which uh, members of the community, particularly femme queens, are not cannot gain the same kind of cannot gain recognition in the outside world or even among their families and communities of origin. But in the ballroom community, there are systems of recognition, of mutual recognition that they are able to benefit from. So this is these are two butch queens who are um, engaged in a vogue battle before the actual ball uh, begins as a form of competition, 
recognition, competition, um, and sort of uh, pre-demonstration of their voguing skills. So the ballroom um, is an example of a, 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 a world that its members create in order to care for, uh, create livable lives of, for its LGBTQ members, many of whom have been ostracized from or marginalized within their families and communities of origin and larger society. It is, and what is very important to the community is the alternative knowledges about gender and sexuality that they create, about family and kinship that they create, and they do it largely through performance. And they also critique the whole notion of gender and sexuality as uh, inherent and innate and essential categories of life as opposed to socially constituted. And um, the dominant ones are a result of settler colonial knowledges and settler colonialism that is still impacting our world today. So the second project that I want to focus on, the second example of uh, a decolonization of, ge of Black genders and sexualities, and this focuses particularly on sexuality in um, HIV prevention and sexual health, is my project um, that's my, my current book part project called Black Gay Sex. Um, as was spoken to before, it is in progress. I'm still writing it, it's taking forever, but <laughs> one day it's going to be done. Um, and it will come out in the New Sexual World series that I co-edit at the University of California Press. What I would like to do is um, read a little bit from a from a chapter uh, that I've written on uh, from this book that talks about the um, homonormative charm circle. Actually, it's the homosex normative charm circle. The homonormative charm circle. Um, little quick story: When I used to teach at Indiana University, this um, class that I taught called Great Gay Histories, Queer Cultures. The final group project that students put together, we have read and, and discussed Gail Rubin's Charm Circle and Thinking Sex. And they put together this sort of uh, contemporary, uh, more contemporary um, Charm Circle that takes into account um, HIV, which Gail Rubin does not quite take into account in her Charm Circle um, in the article. They called it the Homonormative Charm Circle. I change the name and call it to the homosex normativity charm circle. And this um, speaks to the kind of coloni colonization 
of gender and sexual knowledge that uh, public health espouses, even as it uh, suggests that it is trying to save the lives and protect um, Black gay men. So the categories delineated in the homosex normativity term circle correspond to the norms that distinguish distinguishes good sexual subjects and practices from bad sexual subjects and practices. First, the inner term circle comprises HIV negative status, protected sex, and linear life progression. As I argue in the introduction to this book, HIV status is a social category, a vector of power, and one that is constructed through racialized sexuality. Remember, I asked you to remember the HIV status uh, vector of power that I mentioned earlier. Not only does HIV status determine who has access to social and material resources, it also determines who actually obtains resources and who does not, who is desirable and who is undesirable. As a racialized and sexualized social category, HIV status forms a basis of hierarchy of human value. To be HIV negative is to enjoy a privileged status within public health institutions and networks of gay men that form their social sphere. Black gay men experience health disparities that are shaped by perilous socioeconomic conditions that make them vulnerable to HIV. Thus, Black gay men and MSM, men or sex with men, are more severely affected by HIV than any other group in the US. For some Black gay men, maintaining HIV negative status is viewed as elusive and HIV seroconversion as inevitable. Within the HIV positive social category, Black gay men are stigmatized always as already living with HIV. Therefore, they are viewed as vectors of disease and undesirable as romantic and sexual partners. For example, in a study on racial mixing and HIV risk among MSM conducted by H. Fisher and Willie McFarlane in San Francisco, the researchers found among a multiracial sample of 1,142 1, men who have sex with men that, quote, all race and ethnic groups, including Blacks themselves, excuse me, perceive Black men to be riskier subjects with whom to have sex. This study also found that Black men were the least desirable among other racial ethnic groups for sexual romantic partnerships, a result, uh, a result in part of the perception of Black gay men as vectors of power, uh, vectors of HIV. This is why for many, albeit not all, Black gay men claiming HIV negative status is optimal whether they are HIV negative or not. The second category in the charm circle is protected sex. Although public health practice has evolved over the years such that the term condomless sex has superseded unprotected sex, while protected sex and safe sex have lost currency, condom use continues to be promoted by public health practitioners as the single most effective, the primary strategy for preventing HIV exposure and infection. This is the case even in the presence of antiretroviral therapy, which once someone is virally suppressed, uh, prevents them from infecting a partner with HIV. Some public health researchers continue to, con continue to, uh, to, to contribute to this discourse of condom as primary prevention strategy by too often basing their research on HIV risk and Black gay men on condom, um, Black gay men on condom use alone. Um, and let me move to uh, another part of this, this section, linear life trajectory and longevity. So I, in the chapter, I do a whole analysis of this whole, um, and this whole charm circle and talk about how it gets reflected in my um, ethnographic research. Um, so uh, I wanna read a last part of this um, um, charm circle discussion by looking at linear life progression. Linear life trajectory and longevity. So in the book, in the book, In a Queer Time and Place, Transgender Body Subcultural Lives, the queer theorist Jude Palperstam argues that queer time refers to models of temporar temporality that run counter to temporal frames and logics of bourgeois re reproduction 
and family, longevity, risk, safety, and inheritance. I use Halperstam's concept of queer time to illustrate how some Black gay men neither place a premium on longevity nor pursue a linear normative life trajectory. I focus on what Halperstam calls the risk slash safety binary and apply this concept to shed light on how Black gay men think about sexual risk and safety. To extend Halperstam's theorization, temporal life frames that are heteronormative and homonormative place risk and safety in binary opposition and privilege reductive notions of safety. Risk should be minimized and avoided and safety is only about the potential for disease infection as a consequence of sex as opposed to the overall health and well-being of the person having sex. For the homosex normative linear life trajectory, this prioritization of sexual safety over risk is believed to guarantee longevity, which is assumed to be everyone's desired goal. Black gay men are expected to prioritize sexual safety to live longer while sacrificing quality of life and the pleasures and joys that some practices of risk enable. Yet, those who enjoy socioeconomic privilege, particularly white and heterosexual privilege, are not held to the same standards or expectation. As many queer theorists have noted, the risk slash safety binary shapes the gender and sexual politics of life in the US. Likewise, this risk slash safety binary influences HIV prevention and sexual health discourse in public health institutions and common sense among the general public, which promotes the goal of longevity for social reproduction. As it relates to Black gay men, the promotion of safety over risk and longevity for social reproduction over quality of life is about making them available for social and cultural exploitation and extraction for the sake of the racial capitalist political economy, leaving them devoid of pleasure, intimacy, and joy for themselves. What is promoted as the enhancement and protection of sexual health and wellness, in fact, facilitates the pathologization and biomedical exploitation of Black gay men, maintaining a perpetual state of social exclusion and marginalization. As the feminist bioethicist Abby L. Wilkerson suggests, medicine, and I would add public health more generally, has played a central role in naturalizing the inferior status of groups on the basis of race, gender, and sexual orientation. And um, lastly, um, I just wanna talk briefly about how black gay men actually, I argue, respond to this homosex normative discourse that is a settler colonial discourse of black sexualities that public health promotes um, in the name of HIV prevention and sexual health. So the outer, oh, let me go back. So the outer centric, um, I'm sorry, the outer concentric circle of the homosex normativity, normativity charm circle consists of bad sexual subjects and practices such as HIV positive status, unprotected sex, raw sex, and nonlinear life progression. We can assume that bad sex or uncharmed sex includes all condomless sex, serial discordant sex, negative with ne meaning negative with positive, group sex and sex with multiple partners at sex parties, and that and that people who like and those who like to catch nut in their asses or in their throats or swallow the kids, as we say in black gay sexual vernacular. These are bad sexual subjects. In the institutional public health environment. Black gay men who engage in raw sex and bust nuts inside each other are viewed and treated in HIV prevention discourse as bad sexual subjects. On the homosex normativity charm circle, various forms of unprotected sex or what is now called condomless sex hover in the outer limit, uncharmed domain, primarily involving Black gay men and trans women. Public health interventions in the United States that target Black gay men and MSM, men or sexual men, operate from a premise that regards condomless and 
in a condomless anal intercourse as problematic and dangerous, regardless of the other risk reductive strategies that black gay men often deploy. The homosex normative discourse is hegemonic, which is to say that homosex normativity not only structures HIV messaging about and approaches to prevention and public health, it has also been adopted and internalized by many members of black LGBT communities. In chapter two of my book, I discuss how black gay men's raw sex experiences contribute to the formation of their sexual selfhoods, uh, demonstrating how they, how these men negotiate sexual risk and intimacy within their relationships with men. And in this chapter, my discussion of raw sex runs along two dimensions. I illustrate how black gay men create what I refer to as an epistemology of black gay sex. I also highlight how these men describe the pleasure they experience from raw sex. The important point here lies in understanding how black gay men forge an epistemology of sex that influences their participation in the kind of sex in which they engage and the role it plays in their lives. As national HIV prevention efforts gravitate toward strategies such as find HIV positives, test and treat them to reduce viral loads and thereby infection rates, a concurrent international, international conversation about the meaning of sexual health continues. According to the World Health Organization, sexual health constitutes a state of physical, emotional, mental, and sexual well being in relation to an individual's sexuality. The WHO also suggests that promoting sexual health requires an understanding of the complex factors that shape human sexuality, which include both risk and pleasure as well as barriers to and facilitators of sexual satisfaction that function simultaneously. Um, furthermore, the WHO emphasizes the right to information along with the right to pleasure as fundamental factors that determine sexual health. Yet the WHO's definition does not always seem to apply to black gay men. <clears throat> the uh, psychologist and activist Rafael Diaz, uh, Diaz's Latino gay men and HIV culture, sexuality and risk behavior offers a pertinent example for black gay men. In his research on Latino gay men and, and risky sex, Diaz found that for many men in his study, safe sex is particularly sex with condoms, particularly sex with condoms, interrupts and inhibits the pleasure and connection that Latino gay men experience through sex that involve flesh to flesh, mucous membrane to mucous membrane contact, along with the hardness, softness, warmth, and wetness of sex. Similarly, for black gay men, condom use puts a barrier to pleasurable and satisfying sex that may be a source of deep intimacy, connection, and self-affirmation, counterbalancing their experiences of social disqualification, marginalization, alienation, and deprivation. For these men, the lack of pleasurable, satisfying sex life can lead to unhealthy and life-threatening outcomes. So other, um, other, uh, concepts and, and analytics that I use in this book that push back and create an alternative uh, epistemology of sex for Black gay men, in particular, draw from Black feminists and queer um, theories and Black feminists and queer analytics. So I use um, M. Jackie Alexander, uh, Black queer feminist M. Jackie Alexander's notion of erotic autonomy. And I changed that to, um, to look at sexual autonomy. So the, um, the, the, much of the work that my interlocutors are doing and much of the knowledge that they're producing, um, it speaks to uh, taking control um, an agency of their own pleasure pursuits, regardless to um, how public health and other uh, institutional forms of surveillance, sexual surveillance um, impact their lives. I also talk about uh, what I refer to as pleasure placemaking and sexual spatial situations. 
Um, the one of the chapters, um, I do an analysis of black gay sex parties that um, I refer to as anything goes sex parties. And these sex parties are, are, are organized often to deal with the spatial marginalization that black gay men live with. Many do not have access to space. Um, there's a large homeless or unstable housing situation among Black LGBT communities. And so, uh, and there are very limited spaces to convene for social convening, uh, let alone sexual convening. And so they organize the, the sort of underground network of, of sexual parties and they engage in what I call pleasure placemaking and they create, they do, they engage in practices to create uh, an environment a spatial environment, um, an atmospheric environment to enhance the sexual pleasure experience at these sex parties. I draw from um, Patrick Wilson et al.'s um, research that uh, called these uh, some of the practices uh, sexual situations, but I um, extend that by uh, making a case that these men um, are very intentional about creating not only the situations, but the spatialities that um, create the right conditions for um, experiencing sexual pleasure as a part of their sexual health. And um, these pleasure placemaking that create these sexual spatial situations um, amount to what one of my interlocutors call going ham, going hard as a motherfucker. That means like, you know, wilding out, and anything um, you can think of sexually, consensual, anything that you can think of sexually happening within these spaces. And they that is the aim, that's the goal that the pleasure placemaking and the spatial situ sexual situations, sexual spatial situations are designed to create. And overall, I argue that um, I kind of push back and I redefine notions of harm reduction because I argue that um, harm reduction, um, focusing and emphasizing pleasure as a form of harm reduction um, is a way to, for black gay men to mitigate the harm done to them by the homosex uh, normative structures in public health that deny uh, or make it difficult for become obstacles to black, gay men's sexual pleasure and satisfaction. <clears throat> so um, I use these two examples as ways that communities create alternative knowledges about gender and sexuality, their gender and sexuality, and engage in a variety of practices to create better conditions um, to lead livable lives. And part of being, leading a livable life is for the for my interlocutors is pleasure pleasure around performance and reconstituting gender and sexual subjectivities as well as creating spaces for competitive performance and, mut and mutual uh, forms of recognition as well as creating these spaces to experience these spaces and situations to experience optimum um, sexual pleasure and satisfaction. And this is a way to work with communities to and draw from and center the knowledge and ways of knowing and practices that they engage as a form of decolonizing gender, Black genders and sexualities. So thank you for um, your time today. And I look forward to hearing from, hearing your questions. Wonderful, thank you so much for that, Dr. Bailey. Um, so I want to open up the floor for folks to ask any questions that they might have um, about anything you've all seen today or other, or other aspects of Dr. Bailey's work um, and maybe give um, Marlon a moment to get a drink of water or something <laughs> to, to soothe um, his throat after speaking for the last hour. Um, so um, I'll remind folks to use the Q&A um, function um, to utilize that. Okay. Um, 
So while we wait for folks to ask some questions, um, I, um, I'm i thinking of, you know, there I had a lot of thoughts. This first question um, is, might not be sort of in your wheelhouse and not necessarily something um, you're interested in addressing, but in, uh, towards uh, the end there in your talk, you were talking about the comparison between sort of um, the, the risk safety binary and the way that it's essentially deployed um, towards like by the sort of public health um, apparatus um, towards um, LGBT com community, specifically black gay men and how it's in contrast to how sort of the, that risk and, and safety is necessarily sort of deployed in the direction of sort of other privileged social category folks, right? So mm -hmm. cis, heteronormative, um, you know, financial privilege, white, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm really interested in um, if you could talk a little bit about or give an example of how sort of that gray area is allowed in those conversations around privilege, you know, folks occupying privileged categories. And, you know, cause I think it's very clear the ways that like that black and white binary sort of is presented in relation to um, queer folks, right? Um, mm -hmm. But I'm trying to think of ways that it might be different in the ways that it's deployed in other spaces that, that can offer a, sort of a contrast. Does that make sense? I don't know if that was Yeah, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. And um, so let me first say that, that Black gay men do not, research has demonstrated that Black gay men do not have more riskier sex than white gay men. However, Black gay men are only, are less, I mean, Black people are 13% of the population. So Black gay men are a small, um, constitutes a small um, portion of the population, but are over 40% of the HIV AIDS epidemic. And so what I would, and so what I would argue, I'm not, I'm not arguing that necessarily that white gay men are somehow allowed uh, to do whatever they want to do, even though personally I think <laughs> that that's the case. <laughs> But what I'm saying is that public health focus on individual sexual behavior and managing and policing Black gay men's individual sexual behavior um, distorts the real problem. And the real problem is Black gay men's structural location within U.S. society. So it's written, my, the argument that my book makes is that, look, since we know that black gay men do not have more riskier sex than anybody anybody else, but our levels uh, are are substantially higher. I mean, substantially higher. Like the in 2016, the CDC um, determined that one out of every two black gay men will serial convert before their lifetime um, in their life lifetime. Then that's a structural. There's a that brings up structural questions. And the structural question is, how are we dealing with homelessness and unstable housing? How are we dealing with substance abuse disorders? How are we dealing with um, mental health? What, how does stigma impact the structures that Black gay men have to engage in order to um, get the kind of care that they need? Um, what are we doing about violence? What is this whole thing about racism and white supremacy that stru structures every aspect of Black and men's lives? So what I'm arguing is that the focus on Black gay men's individual sexual behavior and managing and policing and modifying is a racist discourse, right? It's a racist discourse right. that it, that is, um, um, what do you call it? That's charading as um, sexual health or protecting black gay men. When that's not, that hasn't been demonstrated as the real concern. And I'm calling on public health research to look at structures as opposed to being so worried about how black gay men get down. <laughs> and and 
in being so worried about how black gay men get down, they also we also miss the risk reductive practices that black gay men engage that do not look like the dominant hegemonic safe sex practices. So, so my book actually do does an examination of a range of practices or includes a range of practices like black gay men are engaged in that are risk reductive and harm reductive. But because they often involve condomless sex or raw sex, then they are not seen as actual effective risk productive and um, harm reductive. Absolutely. Okay. So um, I'm, again, asking folks to ask to submit any questions. Hold on. I think that we might have some. Wonderful. Here we go. Okay, so our first question says, first, thank you for such an informative look into your past and future projects. Um, it's inspiring to see how you are pursuing implementing a critical ethnographic praxis to lead your work. My question is, how have you gone about trying to explain the structures, inequalities, and inequities that exist while keeping your research participants' voice at the forefront of your upcoming book? Oh, excellent question. So that's what, um, as a critical ethnographer, that's the core of what I do, right? Is that I center the experiences, um, the conditions under, with, uh, under which my interlocutors live, but also the ways of knowing that my interlocutors espouse. Is that, because part of, the, part of the problem that we also find in public health, and I've written about this elsewhere about the ballroom community, is that you know, the institution of public health doesn't always take seriously ways of knowing of the very communities that are marginalized in society that it, you know, purports to care about saving and rehabilitating or whatever. And so for me, it's important as a community-based researcher, but also as a Black gay man, to put my interlocutors' ways of knowing and practices um, and lives and experiences in conversations with theories, excuse me, internet, um, interdisciplinary theories that emerge within my field in Black studies and in uh, women's studies, women, gender, and sexuality studies, and Black queer theory, and so on and so forth. So I'm, I'm putting them in dialogue. And much of what I do is I push, um, I use community-based knowledges to put pressure and to push and to expose the unfairness and to offer an alternative way uh, that actually Black gay men, for example, in the ballroom community, they've already figured out, right? <laughs> they've already figured out. <laughs> Basically, they're just saying, y'all just, y'all just get out of our way. We got this. If you are not going to support and uh, facilitate and move barriers, um, institutional barriers out of the way, then it's just 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 stop, just stop, right? So um, that's how I um, that's how I how I engage in it because members of yeah uh, members of the communities that I work with they have an analysis, they have an analysis, they have an analysis of structure, they have an analysis of their relationship to structure, and they also have analysis to their of their experience and their needs. And I just what I do is often I highlight that. And um, and that's what I'm trying to do in this book, and that's what I did in my uh, ballroom book. Wonderful. Okay. Um, so we have another question. It says Dr. Bailey, first of all, that quote by Essex Hampill gave me chills. My question is, as it relates to to it, is in this world where it seems to be so routine to be in the interests of nation states, companies, et cetera, to extend their control to the very bodies of people. What do true sexual liberate, what does true sexual liberation even look like? And what is the path towards that? I ask this, especially in light of the ever increasing influence and prevalence of rainbow capitalism in the past 10 to 20 years in the West. Um, and thank you so much for speaking to today. Uh, what a great question. And my answer is going to be insufficient. <laughs> um, that is, you know, that is the 
that's the question of the day of our time. Um, and actually, I'm currently teaching Queer of Color Critique. And that's the question that we have been grappling with since uh, the beginning of the semester. And it's a question that I hope that we will get more insight throughout our readings. But it's a, it's a difficult question because the, the sort of control of bodies and the state and ruling class manipulation of systems to control bodies on the one hand, and then the diffuseness of power so that the ways in which uh, we experience their hierarchies of human beings and different uh, system of power and control within our communities. Um, it's, it's, a, it's layers and layers of social control. And I wanted to focus on um, colonization and the kind of psychological and discur discursive colonization to evidence you know, that point is that we internalize a lot of it, a, a lot of the sexual regulation, gender and sexual regulation. It, it gets internalized within our communities, even within our queer communities, it's internalized. So in, in Black Gay Sex, I, I, I do a, an analysis of the way that um, Black gay men who admittedly engage in raw sex and who are also uh, living with HIV, they call out the, you know, the politics of respectability among the um, other Black gay men. So there, 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 there's this layer of, um, of regulation. My, my argument, though, uh, in this book is that I'm saying that these Black gay men, the, uh, part of my research, are pursuing uh, sexual liberty. They, they have decided that um, uh, they are unwilling to compromise sexual pleasure and satisfaction in order to adhere to or acquiesce to the cacophony of messaging that they're getting from all over, not just the state, not just public health institutions, but they're within their own communities that deny them um, the ability to have agency on negotiating risk and pleasure. The other, um, the other um, aspect of the Black gay epistemology of sex that I'm, what I'm calling, is that, and this goes back to your earlier question, uh, Nesky, that when we're talking about the uh, risk and safety binary, so for Black gay men, risk and uh, risk and pleasure are co-constitutive. So it's like, so it's not it's it's not this binaristic thing. Either you experience pleasure or you engage in risk. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Risk and pleasure are co-constitutive. That risk produces the pleasure, and pleasure produces the risk. Right, and so that go that runs counter to the dominant um, uh, discourse of public health um, and HIV prevention and sexual health and that risk and pleasure as co-constitutive is a part, I'm arguing, is how Black gay men see sexual health. It's not, sexual health is not about the reduction of risk, totally. For them, it's about the negotiation with risk with pleasure. And, and I think that that is a, that is an attempt to liberate, right? <laughs> Um, I also talk about the kind of counter discourse that Black gay men engage in on um, Black gay sex uh, websites, and the uh, and some of this is uh, you know the, I conducted this ethnography back in between 2014 and 2016. That's the problem with uh, when you do ethnography and it takes you a long time to actually get the book out there. And when it comes out, some of the stuff has already changed, but. 
Um, but yeah, I talk about this promotion of a sexual autonomy uh, in Jackie Alexander erotic autonomy that Black gay men are taking up in order to pursue uh, liberation in the midst of all of the levels of regulation. Um, okay, we have another question. It says, I was struck by the idea of pleasure placemaking and sexual spatial situations. Can you speak more on the practice and how you document spatial relations? Okay, so, so this is a particular ethnographic um, uh, methodological negotiation, <laughs> let me call it that. So um, when I first started conducting this research, um, I had a difficult time, as you might imagine, getting it through IRB and, <laughs> and human <laughs> subject, right? And so what I what I decided to do, and I, I owe uh, some of this to the counsel of my um, mentors at the Center for AIDS Prevention Studies, where I was in resident for three summers and who helped to fund this project, um, is that... I came up with a way to not be in the sex party space or sex club space while getting information. So um, basically I made, I asked my interlocutors to become ethnographers. <laughs> um, and so we gave them a, um, my team and I, we had, uh, we gave them a observation guide and they kind of, uh, described after they had their experiences, they recorded in a in a dictaphone the responses to the observation guide. Then we had a debriefing with them after, so that we could kind of unpack some of the things right that they were experiencing. And so we asked them like, "What did it smell like? What did it look like? What sounds were being made? What were people doing?" And you know, and after I got all of the data back. And, and I particularly asked them to describe, we asked them to describe the spatiality, right? What was the layout, right? And so, and then, then what, okay, so then years later, uh, separate from this um, particular protocol, I went to a sex club myself. I didn't go to sex party, sex club myself, so that I could, as the ethnographer, also um, think about and get a sense of some of the things that they were experiencing in these spaces and some of the commonalities. So, so I also talk about that in the uh, book. And I began to do the analysis and I began to see this theme of the arrangements. And, you know, I'm very similar to my book on ballroom. I'm very into how cultural form, black queer cultural formations create space for the things that they are doing and how this becomes concretized in a way, right? So it becomes um, some, it becomes a kind of standard that they, uh, that these spaces that they create, they're standard elements. And so um, I started um, kind of analyzing and thinking about the different aspects of the space. So they these sex parties have, you know, these sex parties have um, entry rituals. So they have different strategies that they use to protect from infiltration and surveillance. They have um, they have spatial arrangements, but you know they take place at houses and apartments. And you know, black gay men are, don't have access always have access to their own space, and so. Um, <clears throat> So sometimes they happen at hotel rooms and there are things that they have to do to make it uh, spatially conducive for a sex party. They have what I call their, their, no matter where it is, and even at the sex club, as well as the sex party, they have what I call a freak room. So they have an intake room and then they have a freak room. The intake room has, you know, alcohol or whatever, drugs, or what, you know, all of that. In a place where you take off your clothes and where you put your clothes, either put your clothes in a bag or you, um, or somebody will take your clothes for you, you know. And then you have the freak room where the freak and the sex and sex happens, and it's usually dark, you know. It's you know it's usually so the the intake room is light lit, the the freak room is dark. So there, so 
I argue that this is a part of placemaking and also some the uh the environment is usually playing porn, gay porn. Um it's usually dark. There are certain smells, there are certain sounds, um, which as I'm talking about this, I, I need to add that part to the the <laughs> to the chapter. Um and and also there are substances. So uh, another argument that I'm making is that um, black gay men are very intentional about their uses of substances. And it doesn't mean because they use substances that they are addicted or that they are using them in unhealthy ways. That's a pushback against public health. You know, any substances and a mixture of substances and sex is, you know, bad. And I had to be called out from a community member when I was earlier in my career, when I was advancing the same kind of pathologization of Black gay sex by saying that, you know, everything, you know, there were all of these sexual practices that involve uses of substances. And um, I was uh, called out by this activist who said, look, you know, substances help to um, disinhibit and to um, to you know help people feel comfortable that they're served as, as pleasure intensifiers and disinhibitors, and I didn't think about that. And so now I understand. And so that's all a part of the pleasure placemaking. And so what I did was I took this um, conceptual um, work that Patrick Wilson at all uh, made by saying that uh, instead of the overemphasization on uh, sexual behavioral, individual behavior, that we need to focus on the situation and the situation includes group sex, um, unprotected, se unprotected sex or condomless sex with multiple people, uh, semen exchange, substance use. But they're, but Patrick Wilson et al, they're, you know, they're more pathologizing <laughs> <laughs> They're taking a more pathologizing um, perspective. I'm saying, yeah, <clears throat> but these men are intentional about what they're doing, <laughs> right? Because they're the aim is to experience, to have a experience going ham, and and so I said, great, great observation and very useful concept called sexual situation. But it's also about space and it's also about Black gay male agency. And so I connect the pleasure placemaking and the pleasure placemaking creates the spatial sexual situation. That, And the aim of those, the combination of those things is to get to going ham, which is the ultimate, right? Yeah. Okay. So we only have a couple more minutes, but there is one question left. So I just want to ask this last question um, from the, our audience. Um, and um, the question is, how have you utilized your position as a community-led scholar and ethnographer to effectively bring stakeholders, stakeholders and bridge disciplines to advocate for community-informed initiatives or change? Um, I appreciate the commentary of the policing our bodies and placing blame from black and um, brown health inequities, as I find the same is true in perinatal and maternal health, especially as queer and BIPOC birthing people are seen as um, a risk that should be managed as soon as they engage in prenatal care. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. Excellent question. Um, so what it involves is me doing research and being involved in a lot of different community uh, working with a lot of differently different community stakeholders as a researcher, so I do I do a lot of projects on the ballroom community, the ballroom community. We're now um, I'm doing a I'm on a team that's doing a research project that's a pilot study that looks at um, the many men many voices, which is the only um, um, intervention. Uh, endorsed, CDC endorsed intervention for Black gay men, which is for HIV negatives and it's for cis gender gay men only. Well, we're piloting that to turn that into a ballroom um, intervention that would be uh, 
multi-gender because the bar community is multi-gender and HIV status neutral, which would involve both people living with HIV, people who are not living with HIV, and people who don't know they said. So we want to, we are piloting that. I actually have a, I have to do a focus group with that project tonight. Um, we're piloting that so that we can get um, more funding so that we can expand it and hopefully it can be, be taken up as an intervention, particularly for the ballroom community, which there's currently no intervention for the ballroom community, <laughs> even though, and it draws from the family formation in ballroom, the kinship system in ballroom as an asset. It sees it as an asset. So there's that. And I'm also involved in, I'm a uh, board chair of a, a HIV, a black HIV, black LGBT HIV agency in Atlanta, NASM. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm in, involved in research and I'm also involved in policy and I also work with community-based organizations. Prior to becoming board chair of this agency, I was um, board vice chair and I served on the board for uh, BU Wellness in Indianapolis for 12, uh, 11 years. So I do a lot of work in the classroom in research and advocacy and activism and hope and trying to impact public policy. Wonderful. Okay, thank you. We are one minute past, but I'm so glad that folks, I wanted to make sure everybody got their questions answered. Thank you so much to Dr. Bailey and everyone who joined us today. Um, just a quick reminder that we will be back next month on October 18th with our next speaker, Dr. Anania Roy, who will be giving a talk titled Research Justice, Organizing the University in Unequal Cities. Please keep an eye out for details on that talk, and we look forward to seeing you all then. Um, again, thank you to everyone for coming, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everybody. This was wonderful, and thank you for your question.